Chapter 4, Part 3 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Christensen. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnall Burry. Chapter 4, Part 3. The Aristocracy in the Seventh Century Early in the seventh century, then, the Athenian Republic was an aristocracy, and the executive was in the hands of three annually elected officers, the Archon, the King, and the Polemarch. The Archon was the supreme judge in all civil suits. When he entered an office, he published a declaration that he would, throughout the term of his Archonship, preserve the property of every citizen intact. At a later time this sphere of judicial power was limited, and he judged mainly cases in which injured parents, orphans, heiresses were involved. He held the chief place among the magistrates, having his official residence in the Pritaneum, where was the public hearth, and his name appeared at the head of official lists, whence he was called Eponymus. Though the archonship was a later institution than that of Polemarch, as is shown by the fact that no old religious ceremonies were performed by the archon, such as devolved upon the polemarch as well as upon the king. But the conduct of festivals instituted at later times were entrusted to him. Such was the Thargelia, the late May feast of the first fruits, the chief Athenian feast of Apollo, introduced from Delos probably in the seventh century. Such was the great Dionysia, which, as we shall see, were founded in the sixth, the polemarch had judicial duties, besides being commander-in-chief of the army. He held a court in the Epilochion on the banks of the Elysus, and judged there all cases in which non-citizens were involved. Thus what the archon was for citizens, the polemarch was for the class of foreign settlers who were called medics. The king had his residence in the royal stoa, in the agor. His functions were confined to the management of the state religion, and the conduct of certain judicial cases connected with religion. He was president of the council, and thus had considerable power and responsibility in the conduct of the judicial functions of that body. The boule, or council, was the political organization through which the nobles carried out, at Athens as elsewhere, the gradual abolition of monarchy. This council of elders, a part as we saw of the Aryan inheritance of the Greeks, came afterwards to be called at Athens the Council of the Areopagus, to distinguish it from other councils of later growth. This name was derived from one of the council's most important functions. According to early custom, which we find reflected in Homer, murder and manslaughter were not regarded as crimes against the state, but concerned exclusively the family of the slain man, which might either slay the slayer or accept a compensation. But gradually, as the worship of the souls of the dead and the deities of the underworld developed, the belief gained ground that he who shed blood was impure and needed cleansing. Accordingly, when a murderer satisfied the kinsfolk of the murdered by paying a fine, he had also to submit to a process of purification and satisfy the Chithian gods and the Arinyes or Furies, who were, in the original conception, the souls of the dead clamoring for vengeance. This notion of manslaughter as a religious offense necessarily led to the interference of the state. For when the member of a community was impure, the stain drew down the anger of the gods upon the whole community, if the unclean were not driven out. Hence it came about that the state undertook the conduct of criminal justice. The council itself formed the court, and the proceedings were closely associated with the worship of the Semni. These Chithian goddesses had a sanctuary, which served as a refuge for him whose hand was stained with bloodshed, on the northeast side of the Areopagus, outside the city wall. It is possible that the association of this hill with the god Ares is merely due to popular etymology, for he had no shrine here, but the correct explanation of the name Ariespacus. On this rugged spot, apart from, but within sight of the dwellings of men, the council held sittings for cases of murder, violence with murderous intent, poisoning, 
and incendiarism. The accuser stood on the stone of insolence, the accused on the stone of recklessness, each a huge unhewn block. This function of the council, which continued to belong to it after it had lost its other powers, procured it the name of the Areopagus. During the period of the aristocracy, the council was the governing body of Athens. We may be certain that the magistrates were always members, but otherwise we do not know how it was composed, and therefore can form no clear idea how the constitution worked. The council doubtless exercised direct control over the election of the chief magistrates, but we need have small doubt that the king, the archon, and the polemarch were either elected by the ecclesia, consisting of the whole body of citizens entitled to vote, or at all events were chosen by the council out of a limited number nominated by the assembly. As an achievement of the aristocracy, we may regard the annexation of Eleusis, the Eleusian kingdom bound in by Athens on one side and Megara on the other, its little bay blocked by Megarian Salamis, did not play any part in any portion of Greek history of which we have the faintest record, but of its independent existence we have a clear echo in a hymn which tells the Eleusian story of Demeter. That goddess, wandering in quest of her lost daughter, Persephone, came to Eleusis, where she was hospitally entertained by the king, and would have made his infant son immortal but for the queen's want of faith. This poem is thought to have been composed in the seventh century, and, if so, the days when Eleusis was independent had not yet passed out of men's memories then. The middle of the seventh century is marked by a further constitutional change which is the result of various social changes. The aristocracy of birth is forced to widen into an aristocracy of wealth. The general causes of this change are to be found in the new economical conditions, which have been already pointed out as affecting the whole Greek world in the seventh century. But to understand their operation and political consequences at Athens, we must look more closely into the classes of the Attic population and the social structure. Under the rule of the kings and the aristocracies, the free population fell into three classes, the Eupatridae, or nobles, Gorgai, or peasants who cultified their own farms, and the Demiurgi, public workers, those who lived by trade or commerce. The Eupatrids originally lived in the country, and many Attic places were called from their families, such as Peonidae or Butidae. After the Sinoicism, Many of them came to live in the city. The Demiurgi had their settlements in the neighborhood of the city. For example, there was the quarter of the potters north of the Areopagus, and also in the country such as Pelicus or Dadolidae. But besides these classes of citizens who had the right of attending the assembly, there was a mass of freemen who were not citizens. Among these we can distinguish the agricultural laborers who, having no land of their own, cultivated the estates of the nobles. In return for their labor, they retained one-sixth of the produce, produce, and were hence called sixth parters, hectomoroi. There were also the craftsmen who were employed and paid by the demiurgi, and doubtless small retail dealers and others. Although Attica seems to have taken no part in the colonizing movement of the 8th and 7th centuries, the Athenians shared in the trading activities of the period and were profoundly affected by the economical revolution of the Greek world. The cultivation of the olive was becoming a feature of Attica, and its oil a profitable article of exportation. At the same time, Attic potters were actively developing their industry on lines of their own, and Attic pottery was in the course of another century to become disseminated throughout Mediterranean countries, from Tuscany to Cyprus. Jars of this age have been found in tombs near the Dipolon Gate on the northwest side of Athens, and these Dipolon vases, as they were called, give us a glimpse of the Attic civilization of the period. We not only see a new style of vase painting, with geometrical ornament and a symmetrical arrangement of the space at the painter's disposal, but in the picture of funeral processions we can observe with what pomp and cost the Attic nobles buried their dead. In the graves where these vases were found, offerings were laid beside the dead, pottery and sometimes gold ornaments, and this sepulchral pit was surmounted not by a mound, but by a tall clay jar with an opening below, through which drink offerings could be poured. 
but it must be noticed that soon after this epoch the influence of ionia made itself felt in attica and the custom was introduced of burning the dead burial however was not discontinued the two customs subsisted side by side ionia also influenced athenian dress the woolen peplos fastened with a pin was given up and the ionian sleeved tunic or keton of linen took its place it would be interesting if we might see in the rude representation of ships on some of the diplion vases an illustration of the beginnings of attic seamanship the sea traffic at athens must have been rapidly growing in the first half of the seventh century it is easy to see how the active participation of athens in trade began to undermine the foundations of the aristocracy of birth by introducing a new standard of social distinction the nobles engaged in mercantile ventures with various success some becoming richer and others poorer and the industrial folk increased in wealth and importance the result would ultimately be that wealth would assert itself as well as birth both socially and politically and in the second half of the seventh century we find that though the aristocracy has not been fully replaced by a timocracy or constitution in which political rights depend entirely on wealth all the conditions are present for such a transformation for we find the people divided into three classes according to their wealth the principle of division was the annual yield of landed property in corn oil or wine the highest class was the pentecosio mendimni before this name had any official meaning it was perhaps in popular use to designate those large proprietors whose income reached five hundred medimni of corn at the time when oil and wine had not been much cultivated when it acquired an official sense it was defined to include those whose land produced at least so many measures medimni of corn and so many measures metritai of oil or wine as together amounted to five hundred measures the second class included those whose property produced more than three hundred but less than five hundred such measures these were called knights and so represented roughly those who could maintain a horse and take their part in war as mounted soldiers the minimum income of the third class was two hundred measures and their name teamsters shows that they were well-to-do peasants who could till their land with a pair of oxen the chief magistracies of archon king and polemarch were confined to the first class but the principle was admitted that a successful man though not a eupatride was eligible for the highest offices if his income amounted to five hundred medimni it was natural that the rating should be expressed in terms of wealth derived from land but it is not a necessary inference that the handed craftsmen were entirely excluded or that in order to win political rights they were forced to purchase estates at first this concession of the eupatrids to their fellow citizens did not practically amount to much most of the richest men in the state still belonged to the old clans but the recognition of wealth as a political test could not fail to undermine ultimately the privileges of birth the organization of the lower classes into bodies resembling the clans of the nobles and their admission into the brotherhoods have been mentioned it is probable that the institution of the thesmothetai also marks a step in self-assertion of these classes the thesmothetai were a college of six judges who managed the whole judicial system of athens it was their duty to examine and call attention to defects in the laws and to keep a record of judicial decisions and they seem to have taken cognizance of all cases which belonged to the scope of the council of areopagus except trials for murder in fact it looks as if they were practically a committee of that council they were elected annually and it has been plausibly supposed that the number of six was determined by the fact that they originated in a compromise between the orders three being eupatrids two gorgai and one demiurgos they were soon associated with the three chief magistrates the archon the basilius and the polemarch and the nine came to form a sort of college and were called the nine archons each of the nine when he entered on his office took an oath that he would act in accordance with the laws and vowed that if he committed any injustice he would dedicate in gold a man's statute of life size it was a penalty which no archon could have discharged outside these classes were the smaller peasants who had land of their own of which however the produce did not amount to two hundred measures of corn or oil and the humbler handicraftsmen these were called thetes 
the name being perverted from its proper meaning of laborers. The Thetes were citizens, but had no political rights, yet they were beginning to win a certain public importance. The conditions of a growing maritime trade led to the development of a navy. As the sea power grew, a new organization was found necessary, and there can be little doubt that the duty of serving as marines in the Pentaconters mainly devolved upon the Thetes. This gave them a new significance in the state, a significance which would strengthen their claim to political rights when the time for pressing that claim should come. We shall see hereafter how closely connected was the democracy of Athens with her sea power, and we can hardly be wrong in surmising the faint foreshadowings of that connection at the very beginning of her naval history. Each of the four tribes was divided, for this purpose, into twelve districts called Narcarii, each Nacraria was probably bound to supply a ship. Thus the fleet consisted of forty-eight ships. The administration was directed by a body of Nacrari, at the head of which were presidents, and the organization might be found convenient for other than naval purposes. Thus the Nacrari formed an important administrative council. We see, then, that, in the middle of the seventh century, society in Attica is undergoing the change which is transforming the face of all the progressive parts of Hellas. Wealth is competing with descent as a political test, and the aristocracy of birth seems to be passing into a democracy. The power is in the hands of the three chief archons, who always belong to the class of wealthy nobles, and the council of Areopagus, which is certainly composed of Eupatridae, but the classes outside the noble clans, the smaller proprietors and the merchants are beginning to assert themselves and make their weight felt. Possibly the institution of the Thesmothetai is due to their pressure. They also obtain admission into the brotherhoods, which had been hitherto exclusive. Attic trade is rapidly growing. The commercial development promotes these democratic tendencies, and has also led to the creation of a fleet, which, since the poorest class of citizens are required to man it, renders that class important and prepares the way for its political recognition. As yet, however, the naval establishment of Athens was but small compared with her neighbors, Calchas and Corinth, or her daughter cities of Ionia and Agena, which had come for a while under the influence of Argos, outstripped her. It is interesting to find these two cities, Athens and Aginia, which were in later times to be bitter rivals for the supremacy in their gulf, in the seventh century taking part in an association for maintaining the worship of Poseidon in the little island at Calara, over against Troezen. Other coast towns of the Saronic and Argolic bays, Epidaurus, Troezen, Hermium, Nauplia, Prosaic, belong to the sacred union, and the Boatian Archomenus, by virtue of the authority which she still possessed under the sailors of Anthedon, was also a member. There was no political significance in the joint Calarian worship of these maritime towns. Their seamen propitiated Poseidon at Calaria, just as they sacrificed to, to Panhellenic Zeus on the far-seen mountain of Aegina. And these were not grudging votaries. They built a house for the sea god in his island. Its foundations have been recently uncovered, and it is one of the earliest stone temples whose ruins have been found in Greece. Attica, like the rest of the Greek world, was disturbed in her economic development by the invention of money. She had naturally been brought into close commercial relations with her neighbor, Aegina, which at this time began to take a leading part in maritime enterprise. Accordingly, we find Athens adopting the Aeginetan coinage and using a system of weights and measures which was almost, if not quite, identical with the Aeginetan. The introduction of money, which was at first very scarce, and led to the accumulation of capital in the chests of successful speculators, was followed by a period of transition between the old system of the direct exchange of commodities and the new system of a metallic medium. And this transitional period was trying to all men of small means. But the inevitable economic crisis did not come at once, though all conditions of social distress were present, and a conflict between the rich and the poor was drawing steadily near. An event happened about thirty years before the end of the century, which shows that the peasants were still loyal to the existing constitution. The example of tyranny was infectious, and, as it flourished at the very door of Athens, in Megara and Corinth, it was unlikely that some attempt should not be made at Athens, too. 
a certain Cylon of noble family married the daughter of Theagenes, tyrant of Megara, and under Megarian influence and with Megarian help, he tried to make himself master of the city. Consulting the Delphic oracle, he was advised to seize the Acropolis on the greatest festival of Zeus. Cylon, an Olympic victor himself, had no doubt that the feast of Olympia was meant. But when his plot failed, it was explained that the oracle referred to the Athenian feast Diasha in March, which was celebrated outside the city. Cylon enlisted in his enterprise a number of noble youths, and a band of Megarian soldiers were sent by Theagenes. He had no support among the people. He succeeded in seizing the Acropolis, but the sight of foreign soldiers effectually quenched any lurking sympathy that any of the Athenians might have felt for an effort to overthrow the government. The council of the Naucrares summoned the husbandmen from the country, and the summons was readily obeyed. Cylon was blockaded in the citadel, and after a long siege, when food and water began to fail, he escaped with his brother from the fortress. The rest were soon constrained to capitulate. They sought refuge in the temple of Athena Polias, and left it when the Archons promised to spare their lives. But Megacles, of the Alcmonid family, was Archon this year, and at his instigation the pledge was disregarded and the conspirators were put to death. Some feud among the clans may have been at work here. The city was saved from a tyrant, but it had incurred a grave pollution. Such a violation of a solemn pledge to the suppliants who had trusted in the protection of the gods was an insult to the gods themselves, and the city was under a curse till the pollution should be removed. This view was urged by the secret friends of Cylon and those who hated Achmanids, and so it came to pass that while Cylon, his brother, and their descendants were condemned to disenfranchisement and perpetual banishment, the Alchemionids, and those who had acted with them were also tried on the charge of sacrilege and condemned to a perpetual exile with the confiscation of their property and the bodies of those of the clan who had died between the deed of sacrilege and the passing of the sentence were exhumed and cast beyond the boundaries of attica the banishment of the elchamanids had consequences in the distant future and we shall see how it comes into the practical politics of athens two hundred years later the tales also told that the city required a further purification, and that a priest named Epimenides came from Crete and cleansed it. But it has been thought doubtful whether Epimenides is more than a mythical name like Orpheus, since another story brings him to Athens again, for similar purposes of atonement, more than a century afterwards. And then both tales are conciliated by ascribing to the seer a miraculous sleep of a hundred years. In the course of the next ten years, the state of the peasants seems to have changed considerably for the worse. The outbreak of a war with Megara, in consequence of the plot of Cylon, aggravated the distress of the rural population, for the Attic coast suffered from the depredations of the enemy, and the Megarian market was closed to the oil trade. Whether the peasants, who groaned in the, under the existing system, found leaders and extorted concessions from the government, or whether the ruling classes themselves saw the danger and tried to prevent it by a timely concession, it was at all events decided that a code of law should be drawn up and written down. Probably men had been clamoring long to obtain the security for life and property, and what the Thesmathetae may have already done by recording judicial decisions in writing was not enough. Dracon was appointed, an extraordinary legislator, Thesmathetes, and empowered to codify and rectify the existing law. We know only the provisions of that part of his criminal law which dealt with the shedding of blood, for these provisions were not altered by subsequent legislation. In later times it was thought that Dracon revealed to the Athenians how harsh their laws were, and his name became proverbial for a severe lawgiver. An Athenian orator won credit for his epigram that Dracon's law were written not in ink but in blood. This idea arose from the fact that certain small offenses such as stealing cabbage, were punished by death. A broader view, however, of Dracon's code will modify this view. He drew careful distinctions between murder and various kinds of accidental or justifiable manslaughter. In Dracon's laws we meet a body of fifty-one judges, called the Ephetai. They were chosen from the Eupatrids, but it is not clear whether they formed a part of the council of the Areopagus or were a wholly distinct body. Those cases of bloodshed which did not come before the court of the Areopagus were tried by the Ephetai, 
in case the shudder of blood was known. According to the nature of the deed, the Ephetai held their court in different places, in the temple of the Delphinian Apollo, in the Palladian at Phalaron, or at Freato, a tongue of land on the Munician Peninsula. This last court was used in the case of those who were tried for manslaughter committed abroad, and as they might not set foot on the soil of their country, they had to answer the charge standing in a boat drawn up near the shore. When the shudder of blood was not known, the case came before the king in the Pritaneum. It is unfortunate that we are not informed of Drakon's other legislation. We know that the laws relating to debtors were stringent. The creditor could claim the person of the insolvent debtor. In general, he was bound to provide for the interests of the rich power-holding classes. But it was at all events an enormous gain for the poor that those interests should be defined in writing. End of chapter 4, part 3Chapter 4, Part 4 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1 by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 4, Part 4, The Legislation of Solon and the Foundation of Democracy Draken's code was something, but it did not touch the root of the evil. Every year the oppressiveness of the rich few and the impoverishment of the small farmer were increasing. Without capital, and obliged to borrow money, the small proprietors mortgaged their lands, which fell into the hands of capitalists who lent money at ruinous interest. It must be remembered that money was still very scarce, and that the peasants had now to purchase all their needs in coin. Footnote. The value of silver at this time may be judged from the fact that a sheep cost a drachma, a bushel of barley a drachma, an ox five drachmae. A drachma equals about a franc. End of footnote. Even in Attica, the small peasant could not cope with the larger proprietor. Thus, the little farms of Attica were covered with stones on which the mortgage bonds were written. The large estates grew apace. The black earth, as Solon said, was enslaved. The condition of the free labourers was even more deplorable. The sixth part of the produce, which was their wage, no longer sufficed under the new economical conditions to support life, and they were forced into borrowing from their masters. The interest was high, the laws of debt were ruthless, and the person of the borrower was the pledge of repayment and forfeited to the lender in case of inability to pay. The result was that the class of free labourers was being gradually transformed into a class of slaves, whom their lords could sell when they chose. Thus, while the wealthy few were becoming wealthier and greedier, the small proprietors were becoming landless, and the landless freemen were becoming slaves. And the evil was aggravated by unjust judgments and the perversion of law in favour of the rich and powerful. The social disease seemed likely to culminate in a political revolution. The people were bitter against their remorseless oppressors, and only wanted a leader to rebel. To any student of contemporary politics, observing the development in other states, a tyranny would have seemed the most probable solution. A tyranny had already, once at least, and probably more than once, been averted, and now, as it happened, the masses obtained a mediator, not a demagogue, a reform, not a revolution. The tyranny, though it was ultimately to come, was postponed for more than thirty years. The mediator in the civil strife was Solon, the son of Exocestides, a noble connected with the house of the Medontids. He was a merchant, and belonged to the wealthiest class in the state. But he was very different from the Attic Eupatrids, 
rustic squires, of old fashions and narrow vision. We may guess that he had not been a home-keeping youth, but had visited the eastern coasts of the Aegean, whither mercantile concerns might have taken him. At all events he had learned much from progressive Ionia. He had imbued himself with Ionic literature, and had mastered the art of writing verse in the Ionic idiom, so that he could himself take part in the intellectual movement of the day, and become one of the sages of Greece. He was a poet, not because he was poetically inspired, like the Parian Archilochus of an earlier, or the lesbian Sappho of his own generation, but because at that time every man of letters was a poet, there was no prose literature. A hundred years later Solon would have used prose as the vehicle of his thoughts. His moderate temper made him generally popular, his knowledge gave him authority, and his countrymen called upon him at last to set their house in order. We are fortunate enough to possess portions of poems, political pamphlets, which he published for the purpose of guiding public opinion, and thus we have his view of the situation in his own words. He did not scruple to speak plainly. The social abuses and the sad state of the masses were clear to everybody, but Solon saw another side of the question, and he had no sympathy with the extreme revolutionary agitators who demanded a redistribution of lands. The more moderate of the nobles seem to have seen the danger and the urgent need of a new order of things, and thus it came to pass that Solon was solicited to undertake the work of reform. He definitely undertook the task, and was elected archon, with extraordinary legislative powers for the purpose of healing the evils of the state and conciliating the classes. Footnote. The year of Solon's archonship is either 594-3 or 592-1 BC. There is evidence for both. Perhaps the earlier is the more probable. In any case, it seems certain that Solon's legislative activity extended over more than a single year, and likely that he was commissioned as an extraordinary lawgiver, Nomothetes, to revise the constitution. End of footnote. Instead of making the usual declaration of the chief magistrate that he would protect the property of all men undiminished, he made proclamation that all mortgages and debts by which the debtor's person was pledged were annulled, and that all those who had become slaves for debt were free. By this proclamation in that summer, memorable for the rescue of hundreds of poor wretches into liberty and hope, the Athenians shook off their burdens, and this first act of Solon's social reform was called the Sizechthia. The great deliverance was celebrated by a public feast. The character of the remedial measures of Solon is imperfectly known. After the cancelling of old debts, he passed a law which forbade debtors to be enslaved. He fixed a limit for the measure of land which could be owned by a single person, so as to prevent the growth of dangerously large estates and he forbade the exportation of Attic products except oil. For it had been found that so much corn was carried to foreign markets, where the prices were higher, that an insufficient supply remained for the population of Attica. It is to be observed that at this time the Athenians had not yet begun to import Pontic corn. All these measures hit the rich hard and created discontent with the reformer, while, on the other hand, he was far from satisfying the desires and hopes of the masses. He would not confiscate and redistribute the estates of the wealthy, as many wished, and though he rescued the free labourer from bondage, he made no change in the sixth part system, so that the condition of these landless freemen was improved only in so far as they could not be enslaved, and in so far as the law limiting exportation affected prices. 
and Solon was too discreet to attempt to interfere seriously with the conditions of the money market by artificial restrictions. He fixed no maximum rate of interest, and his monetary reforms must be kept strictly apart from his social reforms. Hitherto the Athenians did not coin money of their own. They used the Aegean currency. Solon inaugurated a native coinage, but he adopted the Eubeic, not the Aegean standard. Thus a hundred of the new Attic drachmae were equivalent in value to about seventy Aegean drachmae. The Attic coinage introduced by Solon is to be brought into connection not with the domestic reform, but with the foreign policy of Athens, to which new prospects were opening. The old coinage attached her to Aegina, with which her relations were strained, and to her foe Megara. The new system seemed to invite her into the distant fields beyond the sea, where Chalcis and Corinth had led the way in opening up a new world. A generation later, a new monetary reform introduced a distinct Attic standard, slightly higher than the Eubeic. What Solon did to heal the social sores of his country entitled him to the most fervent gratitude, but it was no more than might have been done by any able and honest statesman who possessed men's confidence. His title to fame as one of the great statesmen of Europe rests upon his reform of the Constitution. He discovered a secret of democracy, and he used his discovery to build up the Constitution on democratic foundations. The Athenian Commonwealth did not actually become a democracy till many years later, but Solon not only laid the foundations, he shaped the framework. At first sight, indeed, the state as he reformed it might seem little more than an aristocracy of wealth, a timocracy, with certain democratic tendencies. He retained the old graduation of the people in classes according to property. But he added the Thetes as a fourth class, and gave it certain political rights. On the three higher classes devolved the public burdens, and they served as cavalry or as hoplites. The Thetes were employed as light-armed troops, or as marines. It is probable that Solon made little or no change in regard to the offices which were open to each class. Pentacosia Medimni were alone eligible to the archonship, and for them alone was reserved the financial office of treasurer of Athena. Other offices were open to the hippies and the Zugiti, but the distinction in privilege between them is unknown. Footnote the offices of the politi, who farmed out public contracts, for example mines, the eleven, heads of the executive of justice, the colacriti, financial officers. End of footnote. The Thetes were not eligible to any of the offices of state, but they were admitted to take part in the meetings of the ecclesia, and this gave them a voice in the election of the magistrates. The opening of the assembly to the lowest class was indeed an important step in the democratic direction, but it may have been only the end of a gradual process of widening which had been going on under the aristocracy. The radical measure of Solon, which was the very cornerstone of the Athenian democracy, was his constitution of the courts of justice. He constituted a court out of all the citizens, including the Thetes, and as the panels of judges were enrolled by lot, the poorest burgher might have his turn. Any magistrate on laying down his office could be accused before the people in these courts, and thus the institution of popular courts invested the people with a supreme control over the administration. The people, sitting in sections as sworn judges, were called the Helia, as distinguished from the Ecclesia, in which they gathered to pass laws or choose magistrates, but were required to take no oath. Having in its hands both the appointment of the magistrates and the control of their conduct, 
the people possessed theoretically the sovereignty of the state, and the meeting out of more privileges to the less wealthy classes could be merely a matter of time. At first the archons were not deprived of their judicial powers, and the Heliaea acted as a court of appeal, but by degrees the competence of the archons was reduced to the conduct of the proceedings preliminary to a trial, and the Heliaea became both the first and the final court. The constitution of the judicial courts out of the whole people was the secret of democracy which Solon discovered. It is his title to fame in the history of the growth of popular government in Europe. Without ignoring the tendencies to a democratic development which existed before him, and without, on the other hand, disguising the privileges which he reserved to the upper classes, we can hardly hesitate to regard Solon as the founder of the Athenian democracy. It must indeed be confessed that there is much in the scope and intention of his constitution which it is difficult to appreciate, because we know so little of the older constitution which he reformed. Thus we have no definite record touching the composition of the Council of the Areopagus, touching its functions as a deliberative body and its relations to the Assembly, or touching the composition of the Assembly itself. We can, however, have little doubt that under the older Commonwealth the Council of Elders exerted a preponderant influence over the Assembly, and that the business submitted to the Assembly, whether by the magistrates or in whatever way introduced, was previously discussed and settled by the Council. The founder of popular government could not leave this hinge of the aristocratic republic as it was. He must either totally change the character of the council and transform it into a popular body, or he must deprive it of its deliberative functions in regard to the assembly. Solon deprived the council of elders of these deliberative functions, so that it could no longer take any direct part in administration and legislation. But on the other hand he assigned to it a new and lofty role. He constituted it the protector of the constitution and the guardian of the laws, giving it wide and undefined powers of control over the magistrates and a censorial authority over the citizens. Its judicial and religious functions it retained. In order to bring it into harmony with the rest of his constitution, Solon seems to have altered the composition of the council. Henceforward, at least, the nine archons at the end of their year of office became life members of the Council of the Areopagus, and this was the manner in which the Council was recruited. Thus the Areopagites were virtually appointed by the people in the assembly. Having removed the Council of the Areopagus to this place of dignity, above and almost outside the constitution, Solon was obliged to create a new body to prepare the business for the assembly. Such a body was indispensable, as the Greeks always recognised, and it is clear that in its absence enormous powers would have been placed in the hands of the magistrates, on whom the manipulation of the assembly would have entirely devolved. The Probulutic Council which Solon instituted consisted of four hundred members, a hundred being taken from each of the four tribes, either chosen by the tribe itself, or more probably picked by lot. All citizens of the three higher classes were eligible, the Thetes alone were excluded. In later days this council, or rather a new council which took its place, gained a large number of important powers, which made it to all intents an independent body in the state, but at first its functions seem to have been purely probulutic, and it has therefore rather the aspect of being merely a part of the organization of the assembly. It must always be remembered that it does not represent the council of elders of the Aryan foreworld, it does not correspond to the Jerusia of Sparta or the Senate of Rome but it takes over certain functions which had before formed part of the duty of the Council of Elders, 
it discusses beforehand the public matters which are to be submitted to the assembly the use of lot for the purpose of appointing public officers was a feature of solon's reforms according to men's ideas in those days lot committed the decision to the gods and was thus a serious method of procedure not a sign of political levity as we should regard it now but a device which superstition suggested was approved by the reflections of philosophical statesmen and lot was recognized as a valuable political engine for security against undue influence and for the protection of minorities it was doubtless as a security against the undue influence of clans and parties that solon used it he applied it to the appointment of the chief magistrates themselves but religious though he was he could not be blind to the danger of taking no human precautions against the falling of the lot upon an incompetent candidate he therefore mixed the two devices of lot and election forty candidates were elected ten from each tribe by the voice of their tribesmen and out of these the nine archons were picked by lot it is probable that a similar mixed method was employed in the choice of the four hundred councillors solon sought to keep the political balance steady by securing that each of the four tribes should have an equal share in the government he could hardly have done otherwise and yet here we touch on the weak point in the fabric of his constitution the gravest danger ahead was in truth not the strife of poor and rich of noble lord and man of the people but the deep-rooted and bitter jealousies which existed between many of the clans while the clan had the tribe behind it and the tribe possessed political weight such feuds might at any moment cause a civil war or a revolution but it was reserved for a future lawgiver to grapple with this problem solon assuredly saw it but he had no solution ready to hand and the evil was closely connected with another evil the local parties which divided attica for these dangers solon offered no remedy and therefore his work though abiding in the highest sense did not supply a final or even a brief pacification of the warring elements in the state he is said to have passed a law so clumsy so difficult to render effective that it is hard to believe that such an enactment was ever made that in the case of a party struggle every burgher must take a side under pain of losing his civic rights solon if he was indeed the author of such a measure sought to avert the possible issues of political strife by forcing the best citizens to intervene it was a safeguard a clumsy safeguard against the danger of a tyranny it is interesting to observe that in some directions solon extended and in others restricted the freedom of the individual he restricted it by sumptuary laws and severe penalties for idleness he extended it by an enactment allowing a man who had no heirs of his body to will his property as he liked instead of its going to the next of kin footnote this measure we may probably assume simply legalized an usage which had been introduced in practice long before End of footnote one of solon's first acts was to repeal all the legislation of dracon except the laws relating to manslaughter his own laws were inscribed on wooden tables set in revolving frames called axones which were numbered and the laws were quoted by the number of the axon these tablets were kept in the public hall but copies were made on stone pillars called in the old attic tongue Kurbais, and kept in the portico of the king every citizen was required to take an oath that he would obey these laws and it was ordered that the laws were to remain in force for a hundred years solon had done his work boldly 
but he had done it constitutionally. He had not made himself a tyrant, as he might easily have done, and as many expected him to do. On the contrary, one purpose of his reform was to forestall the necessity and prevent the possibility of a tyranny. He had not even become an Isimnetes, a legislator like Pittacus, who for a number of years supersedes the constitution in order to reform it, and rules for that time with the absolute power of a tyrant. He had simply held the office of Archon, invested indeed with extraordinary powers. To a superficial observer, caution seemed the note of his reforms, and men were surprised and many disgusted by his cautiousness. His caution consisted in reserving the highest offices for men of property, and the truth probably is that in his time no others would have been fitted to perform the duties. But Solon has stated his own principle that the privileges of each class should be proportional to the public burdens which it can bear. This was the conservative feature of his legislation, and, seizing on it, Democrats could make out a plausible case for regarding his constitution as simply a democracy. When he laid down his office he was assailed by complaints, and he wrote elegies in which he explains his middle course, and professes that he performed the things which he undertook without favour or fear. I threw my stout shield, he says, over both parties. He refused to entertain the idea of any modifications in his measures, and thinking that the reforms would work better in the absence of the reformer, he left Athens soon after his archonship, and travelled for ten years, partly for mercantile ends, but perhaps chiefly from curiosity to see strange places and strange men. Though the remnants of his poems are fragmentary, though the recorded events of his life are meagre, and though the details of his legislation are dimly known and variously interpreted, the personality of Solon leaves a distinct impression on our minds. We know enough to see in him an embodiment of the ideal of intellectual and moral excellence of the early Greeks, and the greatest of their wise men. For him the first of the virtues was moderation, and his motto was avoid excess. He was in no vulgar sense a man of the world, for he was many-sided, poet and legislator, traveller and trader, noble and friend of the people. He had the insight to discern some of the yet undeveloped tendencies of the age, and could sympathise with other than the power-holding classes. He had meditated too deeply on the circumstances of humanity to find power a temptation. He never forgot that he was a traveller between life and death. It was a promising and characteristic act for a Greek state to commit the task of its reformation to such a man, and empower him to translate into definite legislative measures the views which he expressed in his poems. Solon's social reforms inaugurated a permanent improvement, but his political measures, which he intended as a compromise, displeased many. Party strife broke out again bitterly soon after his archonship, and only to end after thirty years in the tyranny which it had been his dearest object to prevent. Of this strife we know little. It took the form of a struggle for the archonship, and two years are noted in which, in consequence of this struggle, no archons were elected, hence called years of anarchy. Then a certain archon, Demasias, attempted to convert his office into a permanent tyranny, and actually held it for over two years. This attempt frightened the political parties into making a compromise of some sort. It was agreed that ten archons should be chosen, five Eupatrids, three Georgi, and two Demiurgi, 
all of course possessing the requisite minimum of wealth. Footnote. We learn this from Aristotle's Athenaeon Politeia, and there is no longer any doubt about the reading. This unique arrangement superseded the Solonian constitution. End of footnote. It is unknown whether this arrangement was repeated after the year of its first trial, but it certainly did not lead to a permanent reconciliation. The two great parties were those who were in the main satisfied with the new constitution of Solon, and those who disliked its democratic side and desired to return to the aristocratic government which he had subverted. The latter consisted chiefly of Eupatrids, and were known as the men of the plain. They were led by Lycurgus, and numbered among them the clan of the Philidae, distinguished as the clan of Hippoclides, the wooer of Agarista, and destined to become more distinguished still as that of more than one Simon and Miltiades. The opposite party of the coast included not only the population of the coast, but the bulk of the middle classes, the peasants as well as the demiurgi, who were bettered by the changes of Solon. They were led by Megacles, son of Alcmion, the same Megacles who married Agarista. For one of Solon's measures was an act of amnesty which was couched in such terms that, while it did not benefit the descendants of Silon, it permitted the return of the Alcmionidae. Their position severed them from the rest of the Eupatrids, and associated them with the party which represented Solon's views. End of chapter 4, part 4 Recording by Graham Redman Chapter 5, parts 1 and 2 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 5, Growth of Athens in the Sixth Century, Part 1. The Conquest of Salamis and Nicaea In the midst of these domestic troubles and party struggles, there were a few statesmen who found time to attend to foreign affairs, and saw that the time had come for Athens to take a new step in her political career. Under her aristocracy, Athens had enjoyed a long period of development which may be called peaceful, if we compare the growth of some other states. And this prepared her to take her place in the general scene of Greek history. Though Attica was a poor country, scantily watered and with light soil, her prosperity in the oil trade might encourage her to look forward to becoming rich. But if she was ever to become a political power, there was one thing to be achieved at all hazards. Every Athenian who stood on his strong hill and looked southwestward could see what this was. He descried, lying close to his own shore, an island which was not his own. And, if he walked across Mount Egaleos, he saw how this foreign island blocked up the bay of what was now his own Eleusis. Almost equally distant from Athens and Megara, Parted by a narrow water from both, Salamis in the hands of either must be a constant menace to the other. The possession of Salamis must decide the future history of both Megara and Athens. At this period Megara, with her growing colonial connections, was a strong state and a formidable neighbour, and her expanding trade must have been viewed with alarm and jealousy by Athenian statesmen. A struggle with Megara sooner or later was inevitable, and the Silonian conspiracy, as we saw, 
furnished an occasion of war. Theagenes could not easily brook the slaughter of his men in violation of the promise which had been given to them, and he sent his ships to harry the Attic coasts. The Athenians sought to occupy Salamis, but all their efforts to gain a permanent footing failed, and they abandoned the attempt in despair. Years passed away. At length Solon saw that the favourable hour had come. It was, perhaps, a quarter of a century after the year of his law-giving. He had returned from his travels and was living at Athens, one of the council of the Areopagus. Megara was now weaker than in the days of the Agenes, and, whether she had given any new cause of offence to Athens or not, Solon and his friends decided that it was time to strike. The great legislator came forward now, not as before to assuage strife, but to stir up to conquest. He composed a stirring poem which began, I came myself as a herald from lovely Salamis, but with song on my lips instead of common speech. He blamed the peace policy of the men who let slip Salamis, as dishonourable, and cried, Arise and come to Salamis to win that fair island and undo our shame. The poem of Solon was intended to have the effect which in later times, when common speech had been perfected to a fine art, would have been wrought by the eloquence of an orator in the assembly. His appeal moved the hearts of his countrymen to a national effort, and an Athenian army went forth to lay the first stone of their country's greatness. An intimate friend of Solon took part in the enterprise, Pisistratus, son of Hippocrates, whose home and estates were near Braron. It has been thought that Pisistratus was the polemarch of the year, but it is more probable that he was only a general subordinate to the polemarch. He helped the expedition to a successful issue. Not only was the disputed island wrested from Megara, but he captured the port of Nicaea over against the island. We may conjecture that Nicaea was surprised first, and that its capture enabled the Athenians to occupy Salamis. Thus, though Pisistratus was associated with the conquest of Nicaea, not with the conquest of Salamis, it was to him, along with his friend Solon, who inspired the enterprise, that the great achievement was really due. The seizure of her port was a great shock to the trade of Megara. It was indeed afterwards restored, when peace was made through the mediation of Sparta, but the hopes of Athenian policy, which its possession aroused, are reflected in the legend, created at this time, that Nisus, the Megarian hero, was a son of Pandion, an early Athenian king. Shortly afterwards, the text of the Iliad, which assumed, as we shall see, its final shape at Athens, was tampered with. The Athenians entered in that venerable record the political geography which they desired. In the catalogue of the ships, where Megara has no independent place, she is counted as a city of Boeotia, two verses were inserted, implying that Salamis belonged to Athens in the time of the Trojan War. There is no reason to suppose that there was any truth in this prehistoric claim, but Salamis now became permanently annexed to Attica. The island was afterwards divided in lots among Athenian citizens, who were called clerics or lot-holders. Salamis, unlike Eleusis, was not incorporated in Attica, though it was nearer Athens. There have been found fragments of a document inscribed on a stone pillar, perhaps, but it is difficult to judge the dates of early Attic writings, not many years later than the conquest, a decree of the people which concerns the settlement of Salamis. One of the earliest scriptured stones of Athenian history, and the earliest example we possess of a decree of the Athenian people. 
the old inhabitants of the island were to pay the same taxes as the Athenians, and to serve in the army, but they were to dwell on their farms in the island, and were not to let their lots to others under pain of a fine. The conquest of Salamis was a decisive event for Athens. Her territory was now rounded off. She had complete command of the landlocked Eleusinian Bay. It was she who now threatened Megara. End of chapter 5, part 1 Chapter 5, Part 2, Athens under Pisistratus The conqueror of Nicaea was the hero of the day. By professing democratic doctrines and practising popular arts, he ingratiated himself with those extreme democrats who, being bitterly opposed to the nobles, and not satisfied by the Salonian compromise, were outside both the plain and the coast. Pisistratus thus organised a new party, which was called the Hill, as it largely consisted of the poor hillsmen of the highlands of Attica, but it also included the Hectimors, for whom Solon had done little, and many discontented men, who, formerly rich, had been impoverished by Solon's measure of cancelling old debts. With this party at his back, Pisistratus aimed at no lesser thing than grasping the supreme power for himself. One day he appeared in the Agora, wounded, he said, by a foul attack of his political foes, his foes because he was a friend of the people, and he showed wounds which he bore. In the assembly, packed by the hillsmen, a bodyguard of fifty clubsmen was voted to him on the proposal of Aristion. We have a monument, which we may associate with the author of this memorable act, in a sepulchral slab discovered near Broron, on which is finely wrought in very low relief the portrait of Aristion, standing armed by his tombstone. And it is hardly too bold to recognise in this contemporary sculpture the friend of Pisistratus, when we remember that the home of the Pisistrated family was at Broren. Having secured his bodyguard, the first step in the tyrant's progress, Pisistratus seized the Acropolis, and made himself master of the state. It was the fate of Solon to live long enough to see the establishment of the tyranny which he dreaded. We know not what part he had taken in the troubled world of politics since his return to Athens. The story was invented that he called upon the citizens to arm themselves against the tyrant, but called in vain, and that then, laying his arms outside the threshold of his house, he cried, I have aided so far as I could my country and the constitution, and I appeal to others to do likewise. Nor has the story that he refused to live under a tyranny and sought refuge with his Cyprian friend, the King of Soli, any good foundation. We know only that in his later years he enjoyed the pleasures of wine and love, and that he survived but a short time the seizure of the tyranny by Pisistratus, who at least treated the old man with respect. The discord of parties had smoothed the way for the schemes of Pisistratus, but his success led in turn to the union of the two other parties, the plain and the coast, against him, and at the end of about five years they succeeded in driving him out. But new disunion followed, and Megacles, the leader of the coast, seems to have quarrelled not only with the plain, but with his own party. At all events he sought a reconciliation with Pisistratus, and undertook to help him back to the tyranny on condition that the tyrant wedded his daughter. The legend is that the partisans of Pisistratus found in Paeania, an Attic village, a woman of loftier than common stature, whom they arrayed in the guise of the goddess Athena. Her name was Phaei. Then heralds, on a certain day, 
entered Athens, crying that Pallas herself was leading back by Zistratus. Presently a car arrived bearing the tyrant and Phaei, and the trick deceived all the common folk. But the coalition of Pisistratus with Megacles was not more abiding than that of Megacles with Lycurgus. By a former wife, footnote, her name is unknown. Pisistratus had also married Timonassa, an Argive woman, whom, being a foreigner, Attic law did not recognize as a legal wife. The sons of Timonassa, Iophon and Hegesistratus, were therefore technically illegitimate, but socially, doubtless, no stain was attached to them. Hegesistratus seems to have been afterwards legitimized and made a citizen. Perhaps it was on this occasion that he received his other name, Thessalus. End of footnote. Pisistratus had two sons, Hippias and Hipparchus, and as he desired to create a dynasty, he feared that if he had offspring by a second wife, the interests of his older sons might be injured, and family dissensions ensue. So, though he went through the form of marriage with the daughter of Megacles, as he had promised, he did not treat her as his wife. Megacles was enraged when the tyrant's neglect reached his ears. He made common cause with the enemies of Pisistratus, and succeeded in driving him out for the second time, perhaps in the same year in which he had been restored. The second exile lasted for about ten years, and Pisistratus spent it in forming new connections in Macedonia. On the Thermaic Gulf he organized the inhabitants of the neighborhood of Rhesalus into some sort of a city-state. He exploited the gold mines of Mount Pangaeus near the Strymon, and formed a force of mercenary soldiers, thus providing himself with money and men to recover his position at Athens. He was supported by Lygdemis, the tyrant of Naxos, and by the friendship of other Greek states such as Thessaly, which he had cultivated in the days of his power. The aristocracy of Eretrian horsemen were well disposed to him, and their city was an admirable basis for an attack upon Athens. When he landed at Marathon, his adherents flocked to his standard. The citizens who were loyal to the constitutional government marched forth, and were defeated in battle at Pellini. Resistance was at an end, and once more Pisistratus had the power in his hands. This time he kept it. The rule of Pisistratus may be described as a constitutional tyranny. He did not stop the wheels of the democracy, but he guided the machine entirely at his own will. The constitution of Solon seems to have been preserved in its essential features, though in some details the lapse of time may have brought modifications. Thus it is possible that even before the first success of Pisistratus, the assessment according to measures of corn and oil had been converted into an assessment in money, and as money became cheaper, the earlier standards for the division of classes ceased to have the old significance. A man who at the beginning of the sixth century just reached the standard of the first class, was passing rich. Fifty years later he would be comparatively poor. But it was not to the interest of the tyrant to raise the census for political office. Various measures of policy were adopted by him to protect his position, while he preserved the old forms of government. He managed to exert an influence on the appointment of the archons, so as to secure personal adherence, and one of his own family generally held some office. This involved the suspension or modification of the system of lot introduced by Solon. The tyrant kept up a standing force of paid soldiers, among them perhaps Scythian archers, whom we see portrayed on attic vases of the time. And he kept in his power, as hostages, the children of some noble families which he suspected. 
most indeed of his more prominent opponents, including the Alcmeonids, had left Attica, and the large estates which they abandoned were at his disposal. These estates gave him the means of solving a problem which Solon had left unsolved, and of satisfying the expectations of a large number of his supporters. He divided the vacant lands into lots, and gave them to the labourers who had worked on these and other estates. Thus the way was prepared for the total abolition of the hectimores. They became practically peasant proprietors, and they had to pay only the land tax, amounting to one-tenth of the produce. Land was also given to many needy people who idled in the city, and loans of money to start them. The tax of a tenth, imposed on all estates, formed an important source of the tyrant's revenue, and it is generally supposed that he introduced it. But this is not probable. We may take it that this land tax was an older institution, which continued under Pisistratus until either he or his sons were able, through an increase of revenue from other sources, to reduce it to one-twentieth. It has been plausibly suggested that this increase of revenue came from the silver mines of Lorion, which now perhaps began to be more effectively worked. His possessions on the Strymon were another mainstay of the finance of Pisistratus. He exerted himself to improve agriculture, and under his influence the olive, which had long ago found a home in Attica, was planted all over the land. Under Pisistratus, Athens rested from the distractions of party strife, and the old parties gradually disappeared. The mass of discontented hectimores was absorbed in the class of peasant proprietors. Thus the people enjoyed a tranquil period of economical and political development, and as the free forms of the constitution were preserved, the masses, in the assembly and in the law courts, received a training in the routine, at least, of public affairs, which rendered them fit for the democracy which was to ensue when the tyranny was overthrown. Abroad it was the consistent policy of Pisistratus to preserve peaceful relations with other states. Aegina, indeed, was openly the rival of Athens, and humbled Megara could hardly be aught save sullen but Athens was on friendly terms with both the rival powers of the Peloponnesus, Sparta, and Argos, and Thebes and Thessaly and the Eretrian knights had helped the tyrant in the days of his adversity. His influence extended to the banks of the Strymon and the coast of Macedonia, as we have already seen, and he had a subservient friend in Lygdemis of Naxos, whom he had installed as tyrant over the Naxian people. It was doubtless with the object of injuring the Megarian trade in Pontic corn, and gaining some counterpoise to Megarian power in the region of the Propontis, that Athens made her first venture in distant seas. It was about forty years before Pisistratus became tyrant that Athens seized the lesbian fortress of Sigeum on the shore of the Troad at the entrance to the Hellespont. The friendship of Miletus, mother of many Pontic colonies, favoured this enterprise, which, however, involved Athens in a conflict with Mytilene, whose power and settlements extended along the shores of the Straits. Mytilene, failing to recover the fortress, built another, the Achillion, close by which cut off the Athenians from the sea. It has been already told how the statesman Pittacus was engaged in this war, and slew an Athenian commander in single combat, and how the poet Alcaeus threw away his shield. It would seem that while Athens was absorbed in her party conflicts at home, Sigeum slipped from her hands, and that the recapture of it was one of the achievements of Pisistratus. The tyrant showed the importance he attached to it by installing one of his sons as governor. The statesman who first sent Athenian soldiers to the shores of the Hellespont 
had, in truth, opened up a new path for Athenian policy, and Pisistratus pursued that path. It was not long before a much greater acquisition than Sigeum was made in the same region, but this acquisition, though made with the good will and even under the auspices of Pisistratus, was made by one who was his political rival and opponent. Miltiades, son of Sipsilus, belonged to the noble family of the Phileids, and was one of the leaders of the plain. It was after the usurpation of Pisistratus that as he sat one day in the porch of his country house at Lasiade on the road from Athens to Eleusis, he saw a company of men in Thracian dress and armed with spears passing along the road. He called out to them, invited them into his house, and proffered them hospitality. They were Dolonsi, natives of the Thracian Chersones, and they had come to Greece in search of a helper who should have the strength and skill to defend them against their northern neighbours who were pressing them hard in war. They had gone to Delphi, and the oracle had bidden them invite the man who first offered them entertainment after they left the shrine. Miltiades, thus designated by the god, obeyed the call of the Thracians, not reluctant to leave his country, fallen under a tyrant's rule. The circumstances of the foundation of Athenian power in the Chersonese were thus wrought by the story-shaping instinct of the Greeks into a picturesque tale. The simple fact seems to have been that the Dolonsi applied directly to Athens, inviting the settlement of an Athenian colony in their midst. Pisistratus was well pleased to promote Athenian influence on the Hellespontine shores, and the selection of Miltiades was not unwelcome to him, since it removed a dangerous subject. We may feel no doubt that it was as an Isist duly chosen by the Athenian people that Miltiades went forth, blessed by the Delphic oracle, to the land of his Thracian guests. But the Isist who went forth, as it was said, to escape tyranny, became absolute ruler in his new country. He ruled as a Thracian prince over the Dolonsi, he ruled as a tyrant over his Athenian fellow settlers. He protected the peninsula against invasions from the north by a wall which he built across the neck from Cardia to Pactii. We hear of his war with Lampsicus and his friendship with the king of Lydia. It is not too much to say that Pisistratus took the first steps on the path which led Athens to empire. That path had indeed been pointed out to him by nameless predecessors, but his sword conquered Salamis, under his auspices Athens won a footing on both shores of the Hellespont. We cannot estimate too highly the statesmanship which sought a field for Athenian enterprise in the regions of the Propontis. The Ionian cities had forestalled Athens in venturing into the vast spaces of the eastern sea and winning the products of its shores. But though she entered into the contest late, she was destined to outstrip both her friend Miletus and Megara her foe. Many years indeed were still to run before her ships dominated the Euxine, but it was much that she now set her posts as a watcher on either side of the narrow gate, where the sea ridge of Helly hangs heavier, and east upon west waters break. Pisistratus strongly asserted the claim of Athens to be the mother and leader of the Ionian branch of the Greek race. The temple of Apollo in Delos, the island of his mythical birth, had been long a religious centre of the Ionians on both sides of the Aegean. There, as an ancient hymn sang, the long-robed Ionians gather with their children and their wives to honour Apollo with dance and song and games. A stranger who came upon the Ionians in their throng 
seeing the men and the fair-girdled women and the swift ships and all their wealth, would say that they were beings free forever from death and eld. Pisistratus purified the sacred spot by digging up all the tombs that were within sight of the sanctuary and removing the bones of the dead to another part of the island. And Athens took not only the Ionian festival under her special care, but also the great Ionian epics. It was probably towards the end of his reign that Pisistratus and his son Hipparchus took in hand the work of arranging and writing down the Homeric poems. Since the poet of Chios had composed the Iliad, since another Ionian poet had framed the Odyssey, new parts had been added by their successors, such as the Catalogue of the Ships and the Poem of Dolon. The minstrels who recited Homer at the Delian festival, for example, adhered to no very strict order of parts in their recitations, and discrepancies were inevitable both in the order and in the text. At the instance of Pisistratus, some men of letters undertook the task of fixing definitely the text of both poems, and wrote them down in the old Attic alphabet. Thus Athens became one of the birth cities of Homer. The Iliad and Odyssey assumed their final shape there. But what the Athenians did for Homer was entirely an achievement in literary criticism. It was in no way a work of original composition. We may say that the Pisistratean revision of Homer was the beginning of literary criticism in Europe. Some liberties, indeed, were taken with the text. A line or two were added, a line or two may have been omitted, for the sake of the political interest or the vanity of Athens. We have met an instance in regard to Salamis. The Homeric enterprise of Pisistratus was thoroughly successful. Athens grew to be the centre of the Greek book trade, and the Athenian text was circulated through the whole Greek world. But before this circulation began, it had been copied out in a new shape. About half a century later, Athenian poets began to give up the old Attic alphabet and use the more convenient Ionic alphabet instead. Homer was then copied out of the Attic letters into the Ionic, and our texts are still disfigured by some errors which arose in the process. The immediate purpose of the revision of Pisistratus was to regulate the Homeric recitations which he had made a feature of the great Panathenaic festival. This feast had been remodelled, if not founded, shortly before he seized the tyranny, and on the pattern of the national gatherings at Olympia and Delphi was held every fourth year. It was celebrated with athletic and musical contests, but the centre and motive of the feast was the great procession which went up to the house of Athena on her hill to offer her a robe woven by the hands of Athenian maidens. The rich fane of Athena, wherein she accorded Erechtheus a place, had the distinction of passing into the Homeric poems. It was situated near the northern cliff, and to the south of it a new house had been reared for the goddess of the city to inhabit, close to the ruins of the palace of the ancient kings. It had been built before the days of Pisistratus, but it was probably he who encompassed it with a Doric colonnade. From its length this temple was known as the House of the Hundred Feet, and many of the lowest stones of the walls, still lying in their places, show us its sight and shape. The triangular gables displayed what Attic sculptors of the day could achieve. Hitherto the favourite material of these sculptors had been the soft marley limestone of the Piraeus, and by a curious stroke of luck some striking specimens of such work, Zeus encountering the three-headed Typhon, Heracles destroying the Hydra, have been partly preserved, 
the early efforts of an art which a hundred and fifty years would bring to perfection. But now, in the second half of the sixth century, Greek sculptors have begun to work in a nobler and harder material, and on one of the pediments of the renovated temple of Athena Polias, the battle of the gods and giants was wrought in Parian marble. Athena herself, in the centre of the composition, slaying Enceladus with her spear, may still be seen and admired. But the tyrant planned a greater work than the new sanctuary on the hill. Down below, southeastward from the citadel, on the banks of the Elysus, he began the building of a great Doric temple for the Olympian Zeus. He began, but never finished it, nor his sons after him. So immense was the scale of his plan that Athens, even when she reached the height of her dominion and fulfilled many of the aspirations of Pisistratus, never ventured to undertake the burden of completing it. A full completion was indeed to come, though in a shape far different from the old Athenian's plan, but not until Athens and Greece had been gathered under the wings of a power which had all Europe at its feet. The richly ornamented capitals of the few lofty pillars which still stand belong to the work of the Roman emperor, but we must remember that the generations of Athenians, with whom this history has to do, saw only plain Doric columns there, the monument of the wealth and ambition of the tyrant who had done more for their city than they cared to think. Pisistratus was indeed scrupulous and zealous in all matters concerned with religion, and his sons more than himself. But no act of his was more fruitful in results than what he did for the worship of Dionysus. In the marshes on the south side of the Areopagus, the Bacchic god had an ancient sanctuary, of which the foundations have been recently uncovered, but Pisistratus built him a new house at the foot of the Acropolis, and its ruins have not yet wholly disappeared. In connection with this temple, Pisistratus instituted a new festival, called the Great Dionysia of the city, and it completely overshadowed the older feast of the wine-press, Lanier, which still continued to be held in the first days of spring at the Temple of the Marshes. The chief feature of the Dionysiac feasts was the choir of satyrs, the gods' attendants, who danced around the altar clothed in goatskins and sang their goat song. But it became usual for the leader of the dancers, who was also the composer of the song, to separate himself from his fellows and hold speech with them, assuming the character of some person connected with the events which the song celebrated, and wearing an appropriate dress. Such performances, which at the rural feasts had been arranged by private enterprise, were made an official part of the great Dionysia, and thus taken under state protection in the form of a tragic contest two or more choruses competing for a prize. It was the work of a generation to develop these simple representations into a true drama by differentiating the satiric element. Legends not connected with Dionysus were chosen for representation, and the dancers appeared not in the Bacchic goat dress, but in the costume suitable for their part in the story. This performance was divided into three acts. The dancers changed their costumes for each act, and only at the end did they come forward in their true goat guise and perform a piece which preserved the original satiric character of tragedy. Then their preponderant importance was by degrees diminished, and a second actor was introduced, and by a development of this kind Hidden from us in its details, the goat song of the days of Pisistratus grew into the tragedy of Aeschylus. The popularity of the worship of Dionysus at Athens in the days of Pisistratus might be observed in the workshops of the potters. 
No subject was more favoured than Dionysiac scenes by the artists, Exequias and his fellows, who painted the black-figured jars of this period. There is another thing which the student of history may learn among the graceful vessels of the potters of Athens. On the jars of the Pisistratean age the deeds of Heracles are a favourite theme, while Theseus is little regarded. But before the golden age of vase painting sets in, about the time of the fall of the Pisistratids, Theseus has begun to seize the popular imagination as the great Attic hero, and this is reflected in paintings on the cups of Euphronius and the other brilliant masters of the red-figured style. If we remember that Theseus was specially associated with the hill country of North Attica, which was the stronghold of the Pisistratean party, we may be tempted to infer that the glorification of Theseus was partly due to the policy of Pisistratus. But besides caring for the due honours of the gods, the tyrant busied himself with such humbler matters as the improvement of the water supply of Athens. West and southwest of the Acropolis, in the rocky valley between the Areopagus and the Pnyx, his waterworks have recently come to light. A cistern there received the waters which an aqueduct conveyed from the upper stream of the Elysus. It is indeed on this side of Athens, south and west of the oldest Athens of all, that the chief stone memorials of the age of Pisistratus stood, apart from what he may have built on the Acropolis itself. But he not only built, he also demolished. He pulled down the old city wall, and for more than half a century Athens was an unwalled town. End of chapter 5, part 2 Recording by Graham Redman Chapter 5, Parts 3, 4, and 5 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnall Bury, Chapter 5, Part 3. Growth of Sparta and the Peloponnesian League While a tyrant was moulding the destinies of Athens, the growth of the Spartan power had changed the political aspect of the Peloponnesus. About the middle of the 6th century, Sparta won successes against her northern neighbours, Tegea and Argos, and in consequence of these successes she became the predominant power in the peninsula. Eastern Arcadia is marked by a large plain, high above the sea level. The villages in the north of this plain had coalesced into the town of Mantinea, those in the south had been united in Tegea. Sparta had gradually pressed up to the borders of the Tegean territory, and a long war was the result. This war is associated with an interesting legend based on the tradition that the Laconian hero Orestes was buried in Tegea. When the Spartans asked the Delphic oracle whether they might hope to achieve the conquest of Arcadia, they received a promise that the god would give them Tegea. Then, on account of this answer, they went forth against Tegea with fetters, but were defeated, and bound in the fetters which they had brought to bind the Tegeates were compelled to till the Tegean plain. Herodotus professed that in his day the very fetters hung in the temple of Athena Alia, the protectress of Tegea. War went on, and the Spartans, invariably defeated, at last consulted the oracle again. The god bade them bring back the bones of Orestes, but they could find no trace of the hero's burying place, and they asked the god once more. 
This time they received an oracle couched in obscure, enigmatic words. Among Arcadian hills a level space holds to jeer where blow two blasts perforce, and woe is laid on woe, and face to face, striker and counter-striker, there the course thou seekest lies even Agamemnon's son. Convey him home, and victory is won. This did not help them much, but it befell that, during a truce with the Tegeates, a certain Lycas, a Spartan man, was in Tegea, and entering a smith's shop, saw the process of beating out iron. The smith, in conversation, told him that wishing to dig a well in his courtyard, he had found a coffin seven cubits long, and within it a corpse of the same length, which he replaced. Lycas guessed at once that he had won the solution of the oracular enigma, and returning to Sparta communicated his discovery. The courtyard was hired from the reluctant smith, the coffin was found, and the bones brought home to Laconia. Then Tegea was conquered, and here we return from fable to fact. The territory of the Arcadian city was not treated like Messenia, it was not incorporated in the territory of Lacedaemon. It became a dependent state, contributing a military contingent to the army of its conqueror, and it bound itself to harbour no Messenians within its borders. At this period the councils of Sparta seem to have been guided by Chilon, whose name became proverbial for wisdom. It was much about the same time, perhaps shortly after the victory over Tegea, that Sparta at length succeeded in rounding off the frontier of Laconia on the northeastern side, by wresting the disputed territory of Thyreatis from Argos. The armies of the two states met in the marchland, but the Spartan kings and the Argive chiefs agreed to decide the dispute by a combat between three hundred chosen champions on either side. The story is that all the six hundred were slain except three, one Spartan and two Argives, and that while the Argives hurried home to announce their victory, the Spartan, Othryades was his name, remained on the field and erected a trophy. In any case, the trial was futile, for both parties claimed the victory, and a battle was fought in which the Argives were utterly defeated. Thyreatis was the last territorial acquisition of Sparta. She changed her policy, and instead of aiming at gaining new territory, she endeavoured to make the whole Peloponnesus a sphere of Lacedaemonian influence. This change of policy was exhibited in her dealing with Tegea. The defeat of Argos placed Sparta at the head of the peninsula. All the Peloponnesian states except Argos and Achaea were enrolled in a loose confederacy, engaging themselves to supply military contingents in the common interest, Lacedaemon being the leader. The meetings of the confederacy were held at Sparta, and each member sent representatives. Corinth readily joined, for Corinth was naturally ranged against Argos, while her commercial rival, the island state of Aegina, was a friend of Argos. Periander had already inflicted a blow upon the Argives by seizing Epidorus and thus cutting off their nearest communications with Aegina. The other Isthmian state, Megara, in which the rule of the nobles had been restored, was also enrolled. Everywhere Sparta exerted her influence to maintain oligarchy, everywhere she discountenanced democracy, so that her supremacy had important consequences for the constitutional development of the Peloponnesian states. In northern Greece the power of the Thessalians was declining, and thus Sparta became the strongest state in Greece in the second half of the sixth century. She was on the most friendly terms with Athens throughout the reign of Pisistratus, but the tyrant was careful to maintain good relations with Argos also. With Argos herself, indeed, Athens had no cause for collision, but the rivalry which existed between Athens and Aegina naturally ranged Athens and Argos in opposite camps. It was perhaps not long before the accession of Pisistratus that the Athenians had landed forces in Aegina, and had been repulsed with Argive help. The policy of Pisistratus avoided a conflict with his island neighbour, and courted the friendship of Argos, 
but the deeper antagonism is shown by the embargo which Argos and Egina placed upon the importation of Attic pottery. The excavations of the temple of the Argive Hera have illustrated this hostile measure. Hardly any fragments of Attic pottery dating from the period of Pisistratus or fifty years after his death have been found in the precinct. End of chapter 5, part 3 Chapter 5, Part 4 Fall of the Pisistratids and Intervention of Sparta When Pisistratus died, his eldest son Hippias took his place. Hipparchus helped him in the government, while Thessalus took little or no share in politics. The general policy of Pisistratus, both in home and foreign affairs, was continued but the court of Athens seems to have acquired a more distinctive literary flavour. Hippias, who was a learned student of oracles, and Hipparchus were abreast of the most modern culture. The eminent poets of the day came to their court. Simonides of Sios, famous for his choral odes, Anacreon of Teos, boon companion, singer of wine and love, Lasus of Hermione, who made his mark by novelties in the treatment of the dithyram, and amused his leisure hours by composing hissless hymns, in which the sound S did not occur. All these were invited or welcomed by Hipparchus. One of the most prominent figures in this society was Onomacritus, a religious teacher, who took part in preparing the new edition of Homer. The first serious blow aimed at the power of the tyrants was due to a personal grudge, not to any widespread dissatisfaction, but nevertheless it produced a series of effects which resulted in the fall of the tyranny. It would seem, but conflicting accounts of the affair were in circulation, that Hipparchus, or according to another story Thessalus, gave offence to a comely young man named Harmodius and his lover Aristogiton. It is said that Hipparchus was in love with Harmodius, and, when his wooing was rejected, avenged himself by putting a slight on the youth's sister, refusing to allow her to bear a basket in the Panathenaic procession. Harmodius and Aristogiton then formed the plan of slaying the tyrants, and chose the day of that procession because they could then, without raising suspicion, appear publicly with arms. Very few were initiated in the plot, as it was expected that when the first blow was struck the citizens would declare themselves for freedom. But as the hour approached, it was observed that one of the conspirators was engaged in speech with Hippias in the outer Ceramicus. His fellows leapt hastily to the conclusion that their plot was betrayed, and, giving up the idea of attacking Hippias, rushed to the market-place and slew Hipparchus near the Leocorion. Harmodius was cut down by the mercenaries, and Aristogiton, escaping for the moment, was afterwards captured, tortured, and put to death. At the time no sympathy was manifested, perhaps little felt for the conspirators. But their act led to a complete change in the government of Hippias. Not knowing what ramifications the plot might have, or what dangers might still lurk about his feet, he became a hard and suspicious despot. He fortified Minicia to have a post on the shore from which he might at any hour flee overseas, and he began to turn his eyes towards Persia, where a new power had begun to cast its shadow over the Hellenic world. Then many Athenians came to hate him, and longed to shake off the reins of tyranny, and they began to cherish the memory of Harmodius and Aristogiton as tyrant-slayers. The overthrow of the tyranny was chiefly brought about by the Alcmeonids, who desired to return to Athens, and could not win their desire so long as the Pisistratids were in power. They had taken care to cultivate an intimacy with the priesthood of Delphi, which they now turned to account. The old sanctuary of Apollo had been burned down by a mischance, and it was resolved to build a new temple at an enormous cost. Footnote. 
three hundred talents, perhaps one hundred thousand pounds, which, in those days when money was scarce and the fortunes of the richest were small, would correspond to six or seven times as much nowadays. End of footnote. A Panhellenic subscription was organised, and by this means about a quarter of the needed money was raised. The rest was defrayed from the resources of Delphi. The Alcmeonids undertook the contract for the work, and the story went that a frontage of Parian marble was added at their own expense, porous stone having been specified in the agreement. The temple was not unworthy of the greatest shrine of Hellas. An Athenian poet has sung of the glancing light of the two fair faces of the pillared house of Loxias, and has vividly described sculptured metopes with heroes destroying monsters, and a pediment with the gods quelling the giants. Footnote. Euripides in the Ion, line 185 at sequentes. End of footnote. It must have been about the time when the new temple was approaching its completion, or soon after, that to the holy buildings of Delphi was added one of the richest of all. The islanders of Siphnos spent some of the wealth which they dug out of their gold mines in making themselves a treasury at the mid-centre of the earth, and its remains recently recovered show us the richness of its decoration. Perhaps this building marks the height of Siphnian prosperity. Before a hundred years had passed, their supply of precious metal was withdrawn. Their miners had got below the sea level, and the water filtering in cut them off from the sources of their wealth. Large sums of money passed through the hands of the Alcmeonids during the building of the temple, and their enemies said that this enabled them to hire mercenaries for their design on Attica. Their first attempt was a failure. They and other exiles seize Lipsidrian, a strong position on a spur of Mount Parnes, looking down on Pianidi and Arcani, but they were too few to take the field by themselves, and the people had no desire to drive out the tyrant for the sake of setting up an oligarchy of nobles. They were soon forced to abandon their fortress and leave Attica. Convinced that they could only accomplish their schemes by foreign help, they used their influence with the Delphic Oracle to put pressure on Sparta. Accordingly, whenever the Spartans sent to consult the god, the response always was, First free Athens. It has already been said that the Pisistratids cultivated the friendship of Sparta, and after his brother's murder, Hippias was more anxious than ever not to break with her. But the diplomacy of the Alcmeonids, of whose clan Cleisthenes, son of Megacles, was at this time head, supported as it was by the influence of Delphi, finally prevailed, and the Spartans consented to force freedom upon Athens. Perhaps they thought the dealings of Hippias with Persia suspicious. He had married his daughter, Archidice, to a son of the tyrant of Lampsacus, who was known to have influence at the Persian court. A first expedition of the Spartans under Anchimolius was utterly routed with the help of a body of Thessalian cavalry, but a second, led by King Cleomenes, defeated the Thessalians, and Hippias was blockaded in the Acropolis. When his children, whom he was sending secretly into safety abroad, fell into the hands of his enemies, he capitulated, and, on condition that they were given back, undertook to leave Attica within five days. He and all his house departed to Sigeum, and a pillar was set up on the Acropolis, recording the sentence which condemned the Pisistratids to perpetual disfranchisement, Atimia. Thus the tyrants had fallen, and with the aid of Sparta, Athens was free. It was not surprising that when she came to value her liberty, she loved to turn away from the circumstances in which it was actually won, and linger over the romantic attempt of Harmodius and Aristogiton, which might be considered at least the prelude to the fall of Hippias. A drinking song, breathing the spirit of liberty, celebrated the two friends who slew the tyrant. Harmodius and Aristogiton became household words.' 
A skilful sculptor, Antina, wrought a commemorative group of the two tyrant slayers, and it was set up not very many years later above the marketplace. The Athenian Republic had to pay, indeed, something for its deliverance. It was obliged to enter into the Peloponnesian League, of which Sparta was the head, and thus Sparta acquired a certain right of interference in the affairs of Athens. This new obligation was destined to lead soon to another struggle. End of chapter 5, part 4 Chapter 5, part 5 King Cleomenes and the Second Spartan Intervention it is necessary here to digress for a moment to tell of the strange manner of the birth of King Cleomenes, who liberated Athens. His father, King Anaxandridas, was wedded to his niece, but she had no children. The ephors, heedful that the royal family of the aged should not die out, urged him to put her away, and when he gainsaid they insisted that he should take a second wife into his house. This he did, and Cleomenes was born. But soon afterwards his first wife, hitherto childless, bore a son who was named Dorius. When the old king died, it was ruled that Cleomenes as the eldest should succeed, and Dorius, who had looked forward to the kingship, was forced to leave Sparta. He went forth to seek his fortune in lands beyond the sea. Having attempted to plant a settlement in Libya, he led an expedition of adventure to the west. He took part in a war of Croton with Sybaris, and then fared to Sicily, with the design of founding a new city in the southwest country. Yet he did not bring his purpose to pass, for he fell in a battle against the Carthaginians and their Illimian allies. It must also be told that after the birth of Dorius, his mother brought Anaxandridas two other sons, Leonidas and Cleombrotus, both of whom we shall meet hereafter. After the expulsion of the tyrant, the Athenians had to deal with the political problems whose solution fifty years before had been postponed by the tyranny. The main problem was to modify the constitution of Solon in such a way as to render it practicable. The old evils which had hindered the realization of Solon's democracy reared their heads again as soon as Hippias had been driven out and the Spartans had departed. The strife of factions led by noble and influential families broke out, and the coast and plain seemed to have risen again in the parties of the Alcmeonid Cleisthenes and his rival Isagoras. As Cleisthenes had been the most active promoter of the revolution, Isagoras was naturally supported by the secret adherents of the tyrant's house. The struggle at first turned in favour of Isagoras, who was elected to the chief magistracy, but it was only for a moment. Cleisthenes won the upper hand by enlisting on his side superior numbers. He rallied to his cause a host of poor men who were outside the pale of citizenship by promising to make them citizens. Thus the victory of Cleisthenes, and the victory of Cleisthenes was the victory of reform, was won by the threat of physical force. And in the year of his rival's archonship, he introduced new democratic measures of law. Isagoras was so far outnumbered that he had no recourse but appeal to Sparta. At his instance, the Lacedaemonians, who looked with disfavour on democracy, demanded that the Alcmeonids, as a clan under a curse, should be expelled from Attica, and Cleisthenes, without attempting resistance, left the country. But this was not enough. King Cleomenes entered Attica for the second time. He expelled seven hundred families pointed out by Isagoras, and attempted to dissolve the new constitution and to set up an oligarchy. But the whole people rose in arms. Cleomenes, who had only a small band of soldiers with him, was blockaded with Isagoras in the Acropolis, and was forced to capitulate on the third day in spite of his Spartan spirit. Footnote Homo's Laconicon Pneon Aristophanes Lysistrata, line two hundred and seventy six. End of footnote. <laughs> 
Cleisthenes could now return with all the other exiles and complete his work. The event was a check for Lacedaemon. It was the first, but it was not the last, time that Athenian oligarchs sought Spartan intervention, and Spartan men-at-arms held the hill of Athena. End of chapter 5, part 5 Recording by Graham Redman